This is your life, episode 52. This is your life. Are you who you want to be? This is your life. Are you who you want to be? This is your life. Is everything you dreamed it would be when the world was younger and you had everything? Hello and welcome to this episode of This Is Your Life. My name is Michael Hyatt and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership. My goal is to help you live with more passion, work with greater focus, and lead with extraordinary influence. In this episode, I'll be talking about the awesome power each of us has to choose our response in any situation, even when we experience pain or face adversity. But first, this podcast is brought to you by Platform University, an online membership site for helping you launch your personal platform or take it to the next level. You can find out more at platformuniversity.com. Now, if you're already a member, be sure and check out the new On the Road video that we posted earlier this week. In it, I shared a limiting belief that's held me back for years, especially in connecting with people. And I think this video will help you examine your own beliefs and then decide which ones serve you and which ones don't. But I want to start out this episode with a story. Back in 2003, I was named president of Thomas Nelson Publishers, and it was an extremely busy time for me. I had made some major changes to my executive team. I basically had two vacant positions, and as a result, I had three jobs. Well, one morning on my way to work, I grabbed my computer case in my right hand, a fresh cup of coffee in my left, and I headed downstairs to the garage to leave for work. Well, four steps from the bottom, the unthinkable happened. I slipped on the carpet, and without a free hand to grab the stair rail, I tumbled forward, and the next thing I knew, I was flat on my fanny on the landing. Well, I wasn't immediately aware of any pain. However, my dress shirt and tie, back in those days I was still wearing one, were soaked in coffee, and I remember thinking, shoot, I'm going to have to completely change my clothes. And this was particularly frustrating because I was already running late and I had a very, very busy day ahead of me. Well, Gail heard me fall and she came running, you know, are you okay? She then raced down the stairs to help me up. I'm fine, but I'm, I'm afraid I've made a huge mess here. Well, don't worry about it, she said as she helped me up. I can clean this up while you get changed. Well, when I put my weight down on my left foot, I let out a yelp. Oh my God. Gosh, I think my ankle is sprained. Well, as it turned out, it was more than sprained. It was broken. And my day, of course, was uh, completely scuttled. In fact, the next 10 days were scuttled. I had to have surgery, including a plate and six screws to repair the damage, which I still have on my leg to this day. In addition, for three months, I had to wear a therapeutic boot in lieu of a cast. And this couldn't have happened at a worse time. Now, at this point... I could have asked myself several questions. Things like, why am I so clumsy? Or, why did I have to have both hands full? Or, why does this have to happen now? Or, why did I have to be in such a hurry? Or, what did I do to deserve this? Listen, the problem with these kinds of questions is that they're a complete waste of time. They're unproductive and they're disempowering. They're natural, of course, and probably even necessary. It's all part of the process of grieving a loss, but ultimately, there are better questions. And one of the best questions you can ask when something negative happens is this, what does this make possible? Very powerful question. But do you see the subtle shift? Suddenly, your attention moves from the past, which you can't do anything about, to the future. It's also an acknowledgement that nothing happens by chance. Everything has a purpose. Even the bad things can have a positive impact when we open our hearts and accept them as part of the plan. And in my particular case, a broken ankle had several positive benefits. For example, I couldn't go to work for a week, so I got some much needed rest. I didn't have any choice. I also had time to set up a blog and start writing on a regular basis, and little did I know this would become the foundation of a major career change 10 years later. I got to board first when flying and usually got to upgrade to first class for free. 
I also learned firsthand about the challenges you face when you're in a wheelchair or on crutches. I was also forced to slow down and smell the roses. I got to see my colleagues take more initiative and gained a new appreciation for them as they helped me about. I got to meet several people I would have otherwise never met, including an amazing surgeon who gave me a whole new perspective on what it means to integrate your faith with your profession. And I had a ready-made conversation starter when I met people I didn't know. Well, the bottom line is this. You can't always choose what happens to you. Accidents and tragedies happen, but you can choose how you respond to those situations. And this is where our real power, our real freedom is found. And what I want to share with you in this episode is four steps quickly for becoming more intentional with your response when you experience adversity or a challenging setback. I'm calling these the ABCDs of responding to adversity. So letter A, acknowledge the pain. Now, this is important. It's not a sign of weakness to admit we're in pain or have experienced a setback. Moreover, it's essential if we're going to break out of our default reactions and make better choices that serve our purposes. We've got to stop pretending. Being positive is a wonderful trait, and I'm surrounded by positive people, thank God. But it can also limit our freedom and come back to bite us if we aren't careful. And it can also be really annoying to those around us if you don't first acknowledge their pain and the setbacks that they have experienced. So first step, letter A, acknowledge the pain. Second step, letter B, be with it. You know, we shouldn't be too quick to eliminate the pain. And this is part of what's wrong with us today. We don't feel what we're experiencing. We're too eager to deny, suppress, or even medicate our pain away. And none of these are ultimately helpful and can lead to further problems. Instead, we should notice what we're feeling. For example, this past weekend, we had a street festival in my hometown, and I live right downtown, so I was in the middle of the whole thing, as we often are several times a year, but traffic was nuts. Lots of people parking illegally, people everywhere, and when I got home from church, I noticed that there was an unfamiliar car in the back of my house. It was locked, and the driver had disappeared, and honestly, I felt violated. I thought, What kind of person just parks their car in a stranger's driveway, locks it, and then walks off? Well, once I acknowledged it, I just let myself be with it, and I tried to pay attention to what I was feeling. I noticed, for example, that I was surprisingly angry, and as I peeled that layer of the onion back, I noticed that what I was really feeling was fear. I felt that this stranger, this person I had never met, had transgressed a boundary and was in my space uninvited, and frankly, I felt vulnerable and exposed. But once I got to this level of understanding, I could deal with it and I could move on. But I had to just first be with it before I could move on. So letter B, be with it. That's the second step. Step three, letter C, have compassion on yourself. Now, most of us are compassionate with others, but hard on ourselves. Doesn't this sound like you? It sure sounds like me. Well, let me encourage you to do something. Don't beat yourself up. We need to extend to ourselves the very same mercy we would offer to a friend who is experiencing the pain that we're experiencing or the setback we have just gone through. Shame and self-condemnation are two of the most unproductive actions we can possibly take. In my experience, they're never productive. For example, I was discussing with my oldest daughter, Megan, about the situation with the person who had parked in my driveway. And I told her I was feeling angry and fearful. And frankly, I was feeling a little guilty about feeling those emotions. And she said, Dad, I totally get why you would feel that way. I'd feel the same way. In fact, I feel that way for you. And I said, you do? She said, absolutely. That's perfectly normal. Well, it was really helpful for her to validate my feelings. And that enabled me to move through the negative emotions and get to the more constructive ones. So step three, let her see, have compassion on yourself. Step four, letter D, do something different. So instead of defaulting to the usual questions, the negative ones that we always seem to ask when something bad happens, it's helpful to try to ask something different like, what does this make possible? I love that question. I use it all the time on myself. I share it with people I know that are going through adversity, and it is really effective in getting people to make a shift in their perspective. But I found this to be a a hugely helpful question 
but it doesn't work when I ask it too early in the process. Be warned. I first have to go through ABC, acknowledge the pain, be with it, and have compassion on myself. But I don't want to stay there. I want to shift my focus and my emotions to something more productive. And that's where this question really helps. What does this make possible? And as difficult as the pain or the setback might be, if we look back on our lives, I think most of us would admit that these times are often followed by tremendous growth and even blessing. So good things can come out of bad situations if we respond appropriately. So let's get to a few listener questions. The first one comes from Chris. Michael, this is Chris Christensen from AmateurTraveler.com and BibleStudyPodcast.com. I was listening to your question about the most important question you can ask when things go wrong. The company that I was at most recently, last startup company, I was the EVP of engineering and operations. And we had a policy that I put in place, which was, it's my fault, so that we could skip right over the question of whose fault it is. Now, you and I may have a different conversation later on and get to the what I thought was the most important question, which is, how can we keep this from happening again? I uh, love the podcast. Thanks. Bye. Chris, that is a terrific question. It's a much more empowering question. And the thing I like about it is it doesn't get stuck on trying to find somebody to blame. And I always like to ask when something goes wrong in my company or some project that I'm working on is what went wrong? Let's just understand the facts so that we get them all on the table and don't try to, to hide them or minimize them. But let's just understand what went wrong. And then, as you said, what can we do to keep this from happening in the future? And then once you get past that, and I definitely think you should milk the experience with that question, I think asking the question, what does it make possible? You know, I'm just one of those people that based on my worldview, I don't believe that things happen by accident. And I think that all things do work together for good. So I just have that kind of innate positivity, but that's a terrific question. And I try to ask it as well. So thanks. The next question comes from Don. Hello, Michael. My name is Don Seuss, and I'm starting to blog at donseuss.com. My question is this. As a Christian, I understand that everything that happens to us, both good and bad, is for our good, ultimately. But when we have become shipwrecked by something catastrophic in our lives, I oftentimes find that it's difficult to see with the eye of faith and become overwhelmed with what I think I see around me. Just wondering if you have any suggestions on how to deal with that so that we might be able to overcome our doubts. Thank you, and I appreciate all the work that you do. Don, this is a terrific question as well, and I would suggest a couple of things here. First of all, go through the four-step process that I outlined earlier in the episode for sure. I mean, you've got to acknowledge the pain. You've got to be with it. You need to have compassion on yourself, and then you can begin to shift your perspective by asking the right question. But I think sometimes when we get, uh, we're going through really catastrophic uh, change or setback, you know, it's really important to talk it out with somebody. And that's where I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a counselor. I don't pretend to be one. Well, maybe sometimes I pretend to be one, but I just want to acknowledge that I'm not one. But I think it's really important to talk to people who are trained in that. And there have been several times when I've gone through a major setback or I've gone through a major transition or I anticipate a transition that I'll go back into therapy with a professional counselor that's skilled at asking questions and is not somebody that's just going to wallow with me uh, in the grief. And it's important for them to do that initially. I mean, to create that empathy, to create that understanding, and, and good professional counselors will do that. But I want somebody that can take me gently by the hand and lead me somewhere else so that I don't stay stuck uh, in the setback or the adversity. So, I, you know, I think that's one of the reasons, frankly, that God puts people around us. Uh, we're not intended to go through some of these difficult situations alone. And I would just ask you, if you're listening to this and you're in the middle of a situation like what uh, Don described or what I'm describing, who can you talk to? And again, not just somebody that's going to keep you stuck, but who can you talk to who is really committed to your ultimate well-being and has got a process for taking you from where you are to where you know you really need to get to? The next question comes from Joan. Hi, Michael. My name is Joan Harrison. I've got a blog at www.thinkgrowlive.com. Um, my question would be, and I always ask this question, when something happens to me, I ask why I have attracted it into my life. And then the second most important question that I ask continually is why. I've asked that since I was a child. 
um, I was a bit of a nuisance as a child because I always asked why. Um, love your work. Thanks. Thanks for those comments, Joan. You know, I, I, I don't think that's a bad question to ask when you ask, what was it that I did or how did I attract this into my life? I just think you have to be careful about not shaming yourself or condemning yourself because first of all, not everything that's bad happens. I mean, this is my worldview. You may differ with it, but I don't believe that every bad thing that happens to us or every adversity is something that we caused. I mean, one of the great examples of that in ancient literature is in the Bible in the book of Job. You know, he just happened to be a, an innocent bystander in a cosmic drama. And that was a situation where God did use it ultimately for his good. And I think that things do happen for a reason, but I'm not sure that I, I fully agree that we always attract everything. And I think we got to be very careful about blaming ourselves or feeling guilty or feeling uh, judged when that happens. Because I know, you know, lots of people suffer terrible things, terrible injustices. Children who have been abused, for example, would be a great example. And I would just be cautious about saying that they attracted that into their lives. I, th- I don't think that really serves them and doesn't serve the process. What they need to do is to just, you know, accept the fact that we live in a world where there are bad things that happen and they're not justified, they're not right, and we need to work uh, past them. And we can turn it to our good and we can use it to our advantage based on the response that we have. And, And that really leads me to your second question of why. I think it is good to ask that question, but I think it can also be an unproductive question if we keep asking that question to those things that simply don't make sense and have no ultimate explanation for. Like, for example, the recent bombings in Boston, you know, a terrible, horrific thing that happened at the Boston Marathon. And we can ask why all day long, and we're probably not going to get a good answer. We can drive ourselves crazy trying to ask it. But I think that's part of what makes evil evil is that it's irrational. There are no answers to some of the questions. They just are. And I think we the better question to ask is how can we use this to our advantage so that we're not defeated by it, but truly we can turn it to something good or turn it into something that's good for more people. So anyway, those are just my thoughts. It's a great question. Both of those are great comments. The next question comes from John. Hello, Michael. This is John Richardson from Carlsbad, California. I blog at personalsuccesstoday.com. My question is, how do you know when something bad happens If it's actually something good in disguise, say the 2008 stock crash, that was actually a great time to buy stocks. Or sometimes, possibly when you lose a job, that it's actually a great time to start a new career. Just curious how you can tell when something's good versus something bad. Thank you. John, my own view is that you often can't tell whether something is good or bad until probably years afterwards, but it's largely what you make of it. How you respond to what happens to you is far more important than what happens to you. And I can tell you, for example, in 1991, I went through a um, catastrophic business failure. It looked like for me at the time, uh, the end of the world. It was certainly incredibly destructive financially to me. And it was one of those things that could have set me back emotionally. And it did set me back emotionally for weeks, uh, if not months. In fact, it probably took uh, several years to really get past it. But as I look back on that now with the hindsight of more than 20 years, I think, oh my gosh, I would not trade what I learned from that experience for anything. Was it good or bad? Well, it was largely what I've made of it. And I've had other experiences like that where I've been fired by a client or I've had some serious uh, run in with one of my kids or a conflict with a friend. And all of those things could be detrimental or they could be good, and it's largely in our hands based on how we respond to it. So that's my thought. The last question, and it's a great one, comes from Mike. Hello, Michael. This is Mike Skiff, and I'm calling from Fort Knox, Kentucky. I blog about topics similar to your podcast topic over at mikeskiff.com. My question is for a friend or a family member of someone who's experienced something very bad happening to them. When someone close to you experiences pain or heartache, what advice can you give in terms of how to respond graciously, demonstrating love and encouragement, rather than judgment or condemnation or a false sense of understanding? Thanks, Michael. I appreciate all that you do. 
Mike, I actually think the four steps I outlined for you to take in response to adversity or a difficult situation work in applying those to other people as well. For example, uh, if I have a friend and they're going through something very difficult, they've had a setback, whatever, one of the first things I need to do is just acknowledge the pain. You know, that's step one. And not in a way that is false or kind of minimizes it by saying to that person, I know exactly how you feel, because often we don't know how they feel. You know, they may be going through something we've never gone through, but just to acknowledge the pain and just to say, gosh, I cannot imagine that must be incredibly painful to just give words to what they're feeling to the extent that you can creates empathy and creates understanding. And that's what people I think need first. And then secondly, I think to just be with it, you know, to be with them in the midst of their pain. And sometimes that means not saying anything, but to just sit with them through their grief or to console them by just being present and not even saying anything, but just to be with them and let them process. And sometimes, you know, they have to talk it out. And sometimes they may be having all kinds of negative emotions. And sometimes those unsettle us and make those make us uncomfortable. But I think we need to give them space to have those emotions, to work through them without condemnation, without shame on our part toward them. If they're angry, let them be angry. If they're depressed, let them be depressed. You're not going to let them sit there forever, but it's important that they get those out there, that they acknowledge them, that they express them, and they just be with those emotions. And then I also think to have compassion on them, you know, to communicate that you understand to the extent possible the emotions that they're feeling and to validate them. And I'm not talking about validating them in a way that would be inappropriate, but I'm just, you know, creating a bridge with your humanity that you've experienced those emotions before. It's certainly understandable and normal that they would experience those emotions and let them have time to express those. And then I think once you've done that, and don't do this too early, I've made the mistake of doing this too early, uh, especially with my family members, and it's not appreciated when you do this, but eventually to get to that question and gently ask, what does this make possible? Or another question I like to ask that's similar to that is, what do you think the gift is in this? And that's one of those questions that really can shift their perspective and begin to give them some traction in making progress out of the situation that they're in and really growing from it. So that's what I would recommend. So great group of questions. The question that I'd like to leave you with if you're listening to this is consider a recent painful experience or a personal setback, how would you have responded if you had to do it all over again? Because guess what? You're probably going to get another opportunity with a personal setback. I think those are all ahead for us and we need to develop some facility, some expertise in dealing with these things so that we're growing and learning over time. Well, to comment on this episode, go to my blog at michaelhyatt.com forward slash 052, as in episode 52. Three quick announcements. I am off the road this week. Next week, I'll be participating and teaching at the SCORE Conference in Orlando, Florida at the beautiful Rosen Hotel. SCORE Conference is spelled S-C-O-R-R-E, SCORE Conference. If you're a professional speaker or just want to be, this conference will teach you how to prepare with focus deliver with confidence, and speak with power. And I know that uh, it's too late to register for this conference. We're sold out anyway. We have been for weeks now. But registration for the September SCORE conference in Vail, Colorado will open on Monday, May the 6th. And we always sell out. So if you're thinking about coming, I would highly recommend that you register sooner rather than later. And I'm not trying to put pressure on you or, or do a sales job. I'm just telling you that this conference sells out. And if you have an interest in it, I would register earlier rather than later. Second announcement, if you're considering launching your own platform, you need to start with a self-hosted WordPress blog. This is not as complicated as it sounds. In fact, I put together a step-by-step screencast on exactly how to do it. You don't need any technical knowledge. I'll walk you through the entire process in exactly 20 minutes. The screencast is absolutely free and you can find it at michaelhyatt.com forward slash WordPress setup. And there'll be a link in the show notes. Third and final announcement is in my next podcast, it'll be on the topic of how to become, get this, a morning person. Well, in episode 28, become more productive by re-engineering your morning ritual. I got a ton of questions 
from people who wanted to be a morning person but didn't know how to become a morning person. And I've got some insights that I want to share with you in the next episode. So if you've got a question about this topic, please leave me a voicemail message at michaelhyatt.com forward slash podcast question. This is a terrific way to cross promote your blog or website because I'll link to it just like I did with the callers in this episode. Well, that's it for this episode of This Is Your Life. I'd be so grateful if you'd rate my podcast on iTunes. That helps tremendously with keeping my podcast visible so that people who have never heard of it can discover it. If you've already done this, thank you so much. I'm very grateful. If you'd like to comment on this episode, please go to michaelhyatt.com. Go to the show notes for this episode and scroll down to the comment section. I'd love to hear from you, whether it's a comment, a question, or whatever. But until next time, remember, Your life is a gift. Now go make it count.